good afternoon, everyone. For those of you who've been in here in this room for the past hour, we just had a very hot and lively debate on the future of work with the Labour Ministry, I mean, Labour Minister uh, Andrea Nahles. And um, in this session, we're going to talk about the future of work as well, but more from a, let's say, comparative perspective. So we are going to look at what's going on in the US, what's going on in Germany, and trying to um, answer the question, how can Germany actually be a leader in the digital age? And um, when you look at this, at this debate in Germany, you basically find two strands of debate. Like on the one side, you find those saying that Uber and all these platforms, they are basically evil and um, we have to hinder them to uh, disseminate even further within our economy. And then on the other side, you have this startup bubble talking about IPOs and why um, Europe is not producing the world's next Facebook or Google. But I think that basically the more important question we have to ask is how do we basically implement these new business models that are um, developing into our setup of a social market economy. And this is the debate we are going to have now. We're going to have uh, three speakers. Um, we're going to have Stephen Hill, um, we're going to have Anna Alex, and we are going to have um, Anke Hassel, and I would like to invite them on the stage. So Stephen, Anke, and uh, Anna, would you please come to the stage? Cool. Just some brief words of, um, of introduction. Just take any seat. Take any seat. <laughs> okay, so um, we have Stephen. Stephen just published a book in English. It's called Die Startup Illusion. Um, wie die Internetökonomie unseren Sozialstaat ruiniert. The Startup Illusion. How the Internet Economy is ruining our welfare state. Um, Stephen was a Holzbrink Fellow at the American Academy here in Berlin uh, last year. He's a political scientist by training. He's now a political journalist, an advisor. He's a columnist for Das Handelsblatt, for uh, Die Zeit. Um, and he's a very interesting person to talk to when you're interested in what's actually going on in Silicon Valley, what's going on in Germany, and how do the two relate to each other, and what can two sides, so to say, learn from each other. Um, then we have Anke Hassel. Anke Hassel is a um, professor of public policy at the Hertha School of Governance here in Germany, and the, she's the um, academic director of VSE, which is an independent think tank uh, funded by the uh, Hans Böckler Stiftung. And we have Anna Alex. She's the uh, founder and CEO of Outfittery. Outfittery is a personal um, shopping uh, platform for men, right? Uh, she was part of the uh, rocket internet ecosystem, so to say. And um, my idea is that we're going to do it like this. We're going to have a very brief introduction by Stephen um, laying out what his book, it's this book, what this book is uh, basically about. And then we're going to have a response by uh, Anke and by Anna. And then I come up with a couple of comments and a couple of questions from my side. And then would like, I would like to open it up to the floor. And uh, we're going to have a debate, um, all of us together. So the question is, how can Germany be a leader in the digital age? And Stephen, how can Germany be a leader? OK, can you hear me all right? We've been given specific instructions on how to hold the microphone. So, <laughs> um, How can Germany be a digital leader? Well, you know, I, I was, uh, the book came out of being here in Germany for about half, year, half of the year last year and talking to many, many people. And I kept hearing, you know, where are the German Facebooks, the German Apples and Googles? Um, you know, Germany needs to be more innovative. Germany needs to be more like Silicon Valley. And as someone who lives in Silicon Valley, my reaction was kind of, wow, are, are you sure about that? And I realized that not everybody really knows what the fullness of Silicon Valley is, the pros and cons. There's certainly some good things. There are a lot of downsides as well. So, um, you, you know, I mean, for example, seven out of 10 startups in Silicon Valley fail. Nine out of 10 never make any profit. Uh, there's just a lot of money. It's, it's basically a casino where a lot of money is being thrown around to find that Facebook or that, that um, Uber or whatever, well, actually, Uber is, is as unprofitable. Uber lost $3 billion last year. Um, 
trying to find that, that rare company that actually makes it through. And uh, can every place, can Germany really afford to have such an imprecise um, policy of promoting business development where seven out of 10 are failing? Uh, I'm not sure that's the best use. Uh, so I go into that in my book uh, uh, quite a little, where I talk about, well, what, what does Germany have that would really build on its strengths? Uh, and one of the things that Germany has is quite remarkable, and I think is underappreciated sometimes because, you know, as Germans, you, 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 just like Americans, we don't appreciate what we have that is good. Um, is the Mittelstand. The Mittelstand, uh, you know, it actually creates 60% of the jobs in my Mittelstand. My, I hope you can understand my terrible German, Mittelstand. Uh, um, it, it's the small and medium enterprises in Germany. So there's, there's, there's millions of them. They create 60% of the jobs. They, um, they uh, uh, 56% of the economic output, a huge amount of the export industry of Germany, and this trade surplus is from the Mittelstand. And, and so, you know, but yet the middle stand is challenged because uh, th this digital era is coming and how do they upgrade, how do they innovate? Well, is there a way to create a hybrid between the startup world and the middle stand? The cultures are actually two quite different in certain ways, but I believe that's possible. And I go, in my book, I go into some of what I think needs, how that could occur. And part of that is because, you know, can Germany have become like Silicon Valley. No, it really cannot. And Germany really needs to find its own path, its own way in that regard. It can have a vibrant startup community. Uh, Berlin has surpassed London and Paris and Stockholm and others as the leading startup city in, in, German, in, in Europe. And yet, uh, that's just the beginning. There's not enough mid middle stage funding. There's a lot of startup funding, including from the government, but not a lot of middle stage funding for these startups. Um, but in addition, the reason why seven out of 10 Silicon Valley startups fail is because at a certain point you realize that there's just no customers that care enough about this product or service being produced at the price point you have to produce it to be profitable. And you see that same thing in Germany. A lot of companies uh, failing because a lack of good ideas. It's hard to find that big idea that scales and becomes big and becomes important. So it, it creating this hybridization between the startup world and um, and uh, the uh, and the middle stand, it, uh, what I call is you'll appreciate this, Anna, rocket middle stand. How to create a hybrid between something like rocket internet, which is good at execution, good at scaling, not so good at innovation. Right? And rocket internet creates uh, you know copycats of Amazon and then sp uh, scales them in different places around the world and then sells it back to Amazon and makes their money in a hundred days and they move on. Uh, this is not exactly innovation, new product, new service, but it is execution, it is scaling. Uh, that's what um, uh, the, the, the middle stand is good at as well. So I think this kind of merger could be good. But that's not what I wanted to talk to you about. <laughs> what I wanted to talk about, the other thing that was surprising in looking at Germany versus the United States, because I'd hear, again, a lot of people say to me, oh yeah, the things like digital economy, Uber, Airbnb, yeah, that's happening here a little bit, uh, but it's not happening as much as in the United States. And the more I looked into that, I actually found not only is it not true, but that government um, uh, statisticians and the way you track these things is actually not, doesn't appear to be as accurate as you, as you think. And that it's actually happening more than you realize. I, I'll say at the outset, the, the, if there's one main message in my book, it's that Germany needs to figure out and could even play a, a, a leadership role in the world in figuring out how do you make part-time jobs into good jobs. That's really the goal that we have now because if you look at the trend in labor markets, whether it's the United States, Europe, Germany, what we see is in the 2008-2009 collapse and the 2010 Eurozone crisis, we lost a lot of the permanent full-time jobs. In fact, Germany has fewer permanent full-time jobs uh, as a percentage of the, work, the number of jobs in Germany today than it had in 2000. Germany has been better than some of the other countries in Europe and the United States in creating some middle-wage jobs, but still not nearly enough. The, 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 the hit against the jobs has come in the middle-wage jobs. But with, even within Germany, those middle-wage jobs are more part-time, temp jobs, solo, uh, uh, self-employed, uh, you know, uh, subcontracting, Werkvertrag, uh, if you can understand my German, uh, types of jobs. This is the trend in the labor markets. And yet, the policies seem to be designed around 
per permanent full-time jobs, the Vice Book and other things that are being uh, put out there. And so for more and more workers, they are dealing with, you know, they don't have enough work. Now, some workers like the flexibility. But unfortunately, they also are going to need security. I mean, it's kind of interesting. When you're young, you're 25, 26, the flexibility seems great. You have enough money to, for your rent. You have, you have enough, um, uh, you know, to, to go to the coffee shop. You have enough to have some beers at night with your mates, uh, all these sorts of things. But as you get into your 30s and you get older, you want more income. You want more security, stability. I mean, some people have tried to say that, the, uh, you know, the millennials, as they're called, or some new post-capitalist generation that are you know, they're, they're, they're cool with having flexibility and this type of digital e economy and, um, you know, going from job to job. Well, you know, you could describe every young generation in the post-World War II era that way. The reality is, as you get older, you want more stability, more security, more income. But the jobs that are going to provide that are disappearing. That's the, that's the challenge. And what they're being replaced with are these precarious jobs, part-time, temp, um, contract jobs, solo uh, self-employed. So the question to me is, how do you take those jobs and turn them into good jobs? Because, you know, the, 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 the post-World War II social contract, whether it's in the United States, Germany, or wherever, is predicated around a type of worker who has a single employer and had, uh, you know, got their, their wage, their their hours, their, um, their job security, and their social security benefits through that employer. That's what's disappearing. And I don't see it coming back. You know, we haven't even really talked about the impact of automation and robots and all these sorts of things and how that's coming faster. Um, that's going to have even greater impact. So how do you uh, make it so that, you know, more and more workers are working for multiple employers today, not one employer. And yet, by doing that, they don't have the social security and some of the, 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 the uh, labor protections that we used to have with the old social contract. How do we make it possible for them to have both uh, flexibility and security? That's the challenge. So what I've proposed in this book is uh, the creation of what I call a portable universal uh, safety net, which is what we call it here in the United States, or social security, whatever you want to call it, welfare system. And what that means is that every worker would have assigned to her or him an individual security account. And every business that hires that worker would pay something into this account, um, a, a certain amount above the wage, that would be prorated to the number of hours that that worker works for that business. So let's say a worker works 10 hours a week for a certain business. That business would pay about a quarter of what a full-time 40-hour-a-week worker would get from a, a regularly employed full-time job. And if that worker had two employers that gave them each 10 hours a week, they would get 25% of that need from each one of them. If they got five hours, they would get a prorated amount. And the amount isn't that great. You know, it works out to about two to three euros uh, more per hour. And that would allow that worker to have uh, health care. You have the employer's half of health care. They still have to pay their half. The employer's half of pension. Uh, you know, injured worker compensation. A lot of the workers working in these flexible, precarious uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, freelance jobs don't have any kind of access to injured worker compensation, all these sorts of things. So it would basically allow these workers to work for multiple businesses and still preserve the security to go with the flexibility. And here's the other thing, is right now, you know, for businesses, let's say I'm in business and you're in business and you're in business, we're all competing against each other. And you're hiring freelancers and contractors and I'm hiring regularly employed uh, full-time workers you're saving about 20 to 25% on your labor costs compared to me. That puts pressure on me to do what you're doing. It's, like, it's what I call the steroids of, of the economy. I mean, it's like, you know, the Tour de France. As, 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 as more and more bicyclists are, are taking steroids and doing the juice, then those who aren't doing it feel the pressure, well, I guess I have to do it uh, as well to compete. Well, by making it so that every employer is going to have to pay for that Social Security, regardless of how that worker works, it takes away that incentive to hire the part-timer to begin with. The, the employer might figure, well, instead of hiring a two or three part-timers, I'll just hire one person full-time because I can build a better relationship because it's not going to save me anything in labor costs. So um, these are the types of things I go into in my book. I, I'm just going to wrap up by saying that um, I think that you know, I mean, the United States, let's face it, we elected Donald Trump, right? 
So in many ways, the leadership on these sorts of issues, even though the United States is suffering from them as much, and in some cases worse, it's not going to come from the United States. It's going to come from places like Germany. And there's reason for Germany to do it because, you know, when you look at the, 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 the Germany actually has uh, about 50% more part-time and temp workers as a percentage of your labor force than we have in the United States. You have two to three times more workers making minimum wage than we have here in the United States. So it's not just a question is that, you know, that's neoliberal America and, um, and, you know, Germany isn't like that, as I kept hearing more and more. In fact, Germany is more like this than you realize, and you're not counting it accurately for reasons I go into in my book, um, having to do with the household survey and all these sorts of mm. things that I can go into during Q&A if there's interest in that kind of nitty-gritty detail. But just know that you're not counting these things. One study found that, that there's actually 90% more of these so-called independent workers in Germany than what official government sources say. 90% more. So we're entering this new world of, of labor, digital economy, and we really have to figure out the way forward to preserve, uh, you know, have good part-time jobs as well as good full-time jobs to create uh, both uh, flexibility as well as security. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Um, in, in, in Stephen's book, there are like two, two major arguments. One, one, is being, one, one is that innovativeness is not really Germany's problem. There are like a couple of things to work on, but that's basically doable. And then the second argument is that the gig economy is already here in Germany. We just don't see it in numbers. And perhaps as a social scientist, you can comment on this if this is like actually the case. Um, but because the gig economy is already here and Germany is becoming a freelance nation and um, we have to adapt our system of social security and welfare and labor market regulation to this kind of new reality. We have to, let's say, softly update our German model. So what do you have to say? So as you have already discovered, this is a very complex book because it ranges from the Silicon Valley and the way the gig economy works to the German low-wage economy. And there's not an obvious connection. And I think we should make this obvious connection because the, the, the way it's set up, this book, and it's a really interesting book, the way it's set up is to say that Silicon Valley in the gig economy produces a low-wage economy in Silicon Valley in California, and that makes it unsustainable. So we do see a lot of social problems. We see low wages, homelessness. We see all kinds of social problems in California as a result of the gig economy, and that is a result because you have a winner-takes-all economy. You have some people, very few people, who get very rich, who drive up prices, and you have a lot of people who work for very low wages and who cannot afford the rent. That is the, the, the argument. And then he moves on to comparing that to Germany, and he sees the German economy works very differently, and that is where the Mittelstand comes in. It says there's a lot of innovation in the Mittelstand, and the Mittelstand is the backbone of the German economy, but at the same time, we have the same social phenomena. If we look at it socially, if we compare labor markets, California to Germany, if we compare the low-wage economy, social problems, we see that we have similar figures and similar numbers when it comes to social problems. And then there's the question, why is that? If we don't have the gig economy, why do we have a similar degree of, uh, of low wages and a low-wage economy? So that is what I take from the book. And that makes it interesting because, you know, you do have very two very different economies, but you have similarities when it comes to low wages. For me, when I look at it, and I share a lot of the analysis which is made there, I share a lot of the assumptions, I wouldn't say that the gig economy has arrived to Germany in a very similar way. I think a very different gig economy, a part of, a, of the gig economy has arrived to Germany. And the other part, which is the reason for low wages and social problems, have nothing to do with the gig economy. The reason why Germany has a lot of social problems and a big low wage sector, which is you know above average in the EU and which is in, to some extent extent bigger than in the United States is nothing to do with technology and it's nothing to do with the gig economy, but it is to do with policies and policies which were enacted about 15 years ago when the labor market was deregulated, when a lot of different ways of hiring people were introduced into the economy. But that has very little to do with the gig economy and technology. One aspect I would like to make now on, on this relationship is really that I would like to see 
um, the causality the other way around. Because as Stephen says, you know, look at the gig economy and look at the many problems it creates. I would say look at the low wage economy and look at the social problems we have in the economy and look at all the problems that will create for us coping with uh, technology and for us coping with digitalization. I would say that the main problem which we have is that we now have already a polarized labor market and this polarization which has to do with wages but also with skills makes it increasingly difficult for us to cope with digitalization and if we want to benefit from it we have to make sure that we have to stop polarization of skills because we need well-trained people and we need well-paid people who can deal with technology. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, Anna, Stephen already uh, addressed the, the rocket way to uh, run companies. Um, is there also a rocket way to envision society? Because um, I'm, j I'm just wondering, right, you're, you're a founder of an internet company, right? Of a uh, company delivering clothing to young men, ordering this clothing via basically apps on their smartphones. So it's not necessarily obvious where's the link to how do you organize a welfare state. So do you think about these issues? Do you think there is some kind of responsibility um, of how you're running these business models, of how the startup ecosystem in Germany is developing with regard to where do we stand as a society when it comes to labor and social issues? Okay. So what, what, what is your role on this panel? That's my question. Oh, that's a good question to me. I mean, you invited me on this <laughs> panel and I see myself actually being more the representative of the startup world and exactly, on the, yeah. all the business side yeah. of, of, of things here. Um, and um, maybe, maybe a few things on this. I mean, I think Rocket in the US is uh, seen very negatively in a sense of just producing copycats. And I mean, I'm not working for Rocket anymore. I used to work there for two years and I need to say that it uh, was a very good school for me to go through this actually and learning the execution side of things. But there was as well something that I was actually missing and that's why I then decided to found my own company not within the rocket ecosystem but to do it completely on my, on my, on my own together with my co-founder. Um, and the thing that was missing was a certain like culture, working culture that I want to see in my own, own company. And um, I mean, by now Outfittery is five years old. We have uh, 300 employees and of course there is as well a big responsibility that I feel and that I have for my team and, and for my business and that I take very, very serious. So I... I, I do think it's it's so you, you can you can learn a lot from working in like different environments and I took a lot from my working experience by, from Rocket, but I think um, so for for me the way was to really combine this with with my own view on the world and my own view on culture and and, and working responsibility that I have for for my team. Yeah, but do do, do you think the 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 way to go forward, Stephen is proposing, so kind of to combine the best of two worlds, right? So the German Mittelstand, when it comes to work practices, what you've just been talking about, with the innovativeness, dynamism of the startup world, right? Do you think there's a, there, there's a way to combine the two, and is this the way to go forward for Germany? I mean, I, 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 from my perspective, must say I have high respect uh, in front of the Mittelstand and in front of someone like who's, who's running a business that might be 100 years old and like founded by the grandfathers and so on and so forth. And we're now with Outfittery at a size that we get frequently asked, are you Mittelstand now? And every time I get this question, I say, oh my God, no. We are not. Um, and the reason why... Uh, yeah, <laughs> in a hundred years, yeah, we might be. So <laughs> but, but, but the reason why I don't see us as a Mittelstand and I don't want to be Mittelstand is that I think it's, it's, it's a question of mindset, actually, that is dividing the startups from the Mittelstand. And the, the Mittelstand is, is thinking about how to preserve the things that has been founded in the past by their grandfathers versus the mindset of the startup is how to disrupt, how to innovate, and how to 
like drastically think different um, than than our our our, our fathers and mm. forefathers. Yeah. So and and this is for me the big difference. It's not in in number of employees which is defining the the Mittelstand versus startup or something. It's a question of mindset. And to be honest, if we can really combine two mindsets within one company, I'm skeptical. Yeah. Anke, you've, you've, you've been talking about low-quality jobs and high-quality jobs. And companies like Anna's, for example, or when you talk to Laura Esnola of Care.com, right? Like the big uh, company who's also in Germany providing also kind of uh, caring services at home. She's basically arguing that we are going to produce the high-quality jobs of the future, right? And you as a labor market and social policy expert, do you think there's anything to this argument? What, that, that Anna produces high That these job? kind of companies are going to produce the high quality jobs of the future? Yes, why not? Yeah. I mean, there's no, I don't think there's any reason why a startup company or, you know, a tech company shouldn't uh, produce high quality jobs. I would expect them to, to produce high quality jobs. I, I don't think that is really Because the issue. Because the, the title yeah. of Stephen's book is yeah. that startups are generally ruining the welfare state. Well, the startups are, you know, okay, so now we're talking about radical innovation. I think that, that is the aspect. If you have radical innovation and if you have business models of companies that produce an alternative to existing businesses and can drive out other businesses out, uh, you know, out from the market, then obviously you eradicate a number of jobs. So if Uber comes to Germany and is successful here, it will have an impact on, on taxi and, and you know, transport businesses. Mm. And then you, you get a radical innovation because you have a completely new business model which you uh, use to have transport services. And there you have, it, you know, you have on the one hand you create jobs, but also you destruct jobs. But whether these new jobs are better than the old jobs or worse, that it depends entirely on the line of business you're in. And it depends entirely on what you employ people for. I don't know, you know, what your staff does, but I can imagine it is not just, you know, low quality or unskilled labor, and it is rather high quality because you have to, you know, I actually do not know what your staff does, so I really don't know. But there, there's no assumption, you know, there's no pre-assumption that startups lead to bad or, or worse jobs. Yeah, so you would call for a differentiation in the debate, right? To, to stop kind of the blunt, you know, yeah. startup bashing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Stephen. Uh, let me just explain a little bit about how this title came about, which I didn't pick, <laughs> the publisher did. Um, but here's, here's um, what some of the danger is. Um, there's a company based in Silicon Valley called Upwork. They have 250 regular employees, and they use technology to oversee uh, 10 million freelancers all over the world. And those freelancers are, are doing things like uh, computer programmers, software designers, translators, graphic designers. There are architects, there are engineers. I mean, there's a huge number of occupations and industries on this platform uh, looking for work. And, uh, you know, they, uh, it's basically an online labor auction. You can go there to hire someone and they bid on the job and you can see the bids going lower and lower. You'll see a German worker on there saying, I'd like to make 60 euros an hour for this job. You can see a US worker saying, I'd like to make $70 an hour for this job. And then there's workers from Thailand, India, Philippines saying, I'll take two euros an hour for this job. And those workers are highly trained. They have access to technology and companies like Outfittery and whoever it is can hire them wherever they are. And they produce the product, they upload it to Dropbox, they email it by, uh, on the internet, however they want to deliver the product. You know, it used to be to outsource jobs, you had to, take, you had to move a plant to another country, and that was expensive, so it, it was a, a, a barrier to doing that. Now, you can outsource jobs just by having a website. You can, you can, and that's what's happening. 10 million freelancers on this platform of Upwork. Now, I asked some of the German um, researchers and you know, government officials and others, how many German workers are on the platform Upwork? They said, I don't know. We don't know. We have no idea. We're not counting them. And um, so, you know, it took me about 20 minutes to go on the Upwork website, use some filters, and find out there's about 18,800 German workers on this one platform. It took me 20 minutes. So the fact that German uh, researchers don't know that and didn't do that 20-minute job shows you that it, they don't think it's important, um, there's no emphasis on it, and, you know, so they just didn't bother. That's just one platform, and there are dozens of these platforms now. How many of these workers are there? Because, you know, if they're being hired by 
an employer in the United States or in India or Russia or wherever, you can get, be sure that that employer is not telling the German government, hey, I hired this German and, I, and they made 5,000 euros last year working for me. They're not telling the, ger the German government about this. The worker probably isn't either. All right? Um, and so the g government is not really counting these workers. I mean, it's not that they don't know how. They're just literally not even trying. And yet, there is some organizations that are trying. Those are the labor unions. IG Metall, Verde, they're trying to count these workers. And some of the studies that have been done estimate that there's about a million to two million of these sorts of click workers, as they're called, in Germany. So just using conservative numbers, if there is, you know, one and a half million of these workers, um, that's about four billion euros in income that's not being tracked. That's not being taxed for income purposes. That's about 670 million euros that's not going into the health care fund. Just using conservative numbers. So this is serious money. And this is just, you know, it's, we're only at the beginning of what these technologies are going to do, how these companies are going to be hiring workers to replace permanent full-time workers. We're already seeing those trends in the labor markets. Fewer permanent full-time jobs today than there were in 2000. More part-time, temporary work, uh, you know, solo self-employed, all these sorts of things. So um, if, if enough workers are working this way and you're not getting the revenue, that's going to undermine the taxes you need for health care, for transportation, for education, for all the social uh, needs that exist here in Germany. Uh, and the fact that they're not being counted, and as I mentioned, even for one the ways they are counting, other studies, because the way the German uh, system works, and the US system too, is use a household survey. Someone literally calls up people and says, you know, what kind of, how do you work? Do you have one job, two jobs? But they only stop at two jobs. They don't ask, do you have third and fourth jobs? And they don't ask very much about the second job. They're still using the assumption of permanent full-time jobs, the old post-World War II model, to get that information about the first job. But there's a lot of evidence that more workers are working this way, and they don't self-report accurately. They don't necessarily tell you that they have a third and fourth job unless you really get that information out of them. And so other independent researchers that have been tracking Germany and the US and other places are finding that the number of independent workers that are working separate from this permanent full-time core employment is in Germany 90% higher than what official uh, government sources say. So, you know, there's, there's a numbers game going on here. Do we really, do we have the methodology to count the ways that people are working? Anka, do you think we do? I'm curious. Um, on the methodology, you know, that there is more research on counting people who work on platform, on click workers, crowd workers, and as you mentioned, there are, uh, you know, efforts to recruit these workers, to give them a platform, to unionize them, etc. I, I don't think that, they, that people underestimate the phenomenon. I really don't think so. I think there's an awareness of that, and there's monitoring going on, on, you know, how do they develop, what is the impact, you know, how many people are there. And there are also policy, you know, proposals already. If you read the vice book by the government, they they deal with these issues and they deal with, you know, how should we insure freelancers, what kind of pension insurance should they have, what kind of access to health insurance, etc. So in, in that sense, I, no, I don't think that, you know, that there's a serious underestimation of the problem going on. I think it is, you know, it has come to Germany later than the US, so this is a recent phenomenon and people now start looking into it and, you know, research is more recent than in other places, but it's not that, you know, people go, you know, are blind to the phenomenon here. Mm. I wouldn't say that at yeah. all. The, the, the question, as you said, is, you know, how important do we say this phenomenon is? If we have, you know, two million freelance workers who are self-employed and do not have any employees themselves, so not business people, but freelancers. So, and these two million people, some of them might be insured through their spouses, through their families, have other ways of insurance, etc. So some of them really are out in the open. You know, they are underinsured. We know they will, you know, probably will not make a living in the long run. They will probably end up as, you know, poor freelancers. They are now poor and they, you know, in 10 years' time, if they're still freelance, they, they will still be freelancers and they... There will be old age poverty coming from that. And then the question is, you know, these, maybe it's, a, maybe it's one million people, yeah? So do we design, do we need to uh, reform our insurance system to take care of these one million people? I would say yes, 
yeah, and there's a discussion on you know, about this. There is a discussion how can we integrate people into pension insurance. Of course, we could, but we also know that if they were integrated as everyone else, the insurance contributions would be so high that it would deter people to declare their work. You know, we know that we drive people out of declaring their work because uh, health insurance is incredibly expensive and pension insurance is incredibly ex expensive. So we need to lower contributions. How can we do that? Can we ask the government to step in? Can we ask, ask the government to make contributions as they do or businesses? Uh, can we tax businesses accordingly? There's a discussion among platforms. There are platform uh, companies now saying we want to be taxed because we want to give insurances for our freelancers, but at the moment we cannot do so because if we do so, you know, our competitors will drive us out of the market because they, you know, they don't pay insurances. So I think this is an ongoing policy debate, but I wouldn't be as pessimistic and as negative as you that we will not find the answers for that. Well, Let's leave. I don't think I'm negative. I think that are pessimistic. I think you will, but uh, the trends are, are are going in a different direction. I mean, if you look at the Vice book, it's predicated for the most part on full-time jobs, and yet there are fewer permanent full-time jobs in Germany now than there was in 2000. So, let's let, let's leave the technical argument here. I would like to open it up to three, uh, two two rounds of, of of questions. Please do ask questions. Please be brief. Please feel free to address um, people on the stage. Um, and let's do questions in rounds of three. So two rounds of three questions, right? So oh. please raise your hands. There are people with microphones in the middle and on the left side. Raise your hands if you have any questions and then come to me. Okay. Or to my colleague. To your left. So please go there. Please do approach the people holding the microphone, okay? Okay. So thank you very much for the interesting speech. Um, I have a question because uh, I agree with Ms. Hassel and I disagree with Mr. Hill a bit um, because you described a lot of major economic trends in Germany and um, I would fully agree to say that when we look at the technical labor market, then we see those trends strengthening, so more and more freelancers. But, but the way you described it gave me the impression that you described the major economic trends on the labor market in Germany and therefore I actually fully have to disagree because um, we have a lot of part-time jobs in Germany but that is mainly a female pro problem so the structures we have in Germany lead to the consequence that 60% of the people working in part-time are women and not men and um, we also have at the moment 1.1 million jobs who cannot be filled so we have a huge demand for people working and we also have a law in Germany that um, tries to prohibit freelance workers because you said that um, that if you would have a company you would then just employ freelance people so it would be cheaper for you because yeah, then then you would save uh, costs um, wage costs which is not true because we have a law that prohibits you uh, to have so-called uh, Scheinselbstständigkeit so these are all things that are that are um, very that makes the the view on how Germany and the labor market works very differently from the point of view you described so my question is first um, was your was your description only based on the technical labor market or the well the digital labor market and second of all, we talked a lot about labor policy, but I think in order to strengthen the digital economy, their labor policy is only just one way, and there are many other keys uh, we need to start. So what are your ideas on different topics than labor market policy? Okay, let's, let's take a second question. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, my name is Cyrus. One, one thing I uh, realized is that in services, which is about two-thirds of our, in, um, let's say, labor, uh, community or labor shift um, where digital digitalization is starting some trends like scan and go like you go into a, a supermarket and then you go on scan on your own your shop uh, items and then you go to an electronic uh, cashier and he's making all the um, uh, let's say um, buyout or uh, shopping for you and there's only one person who's guiding you or two persons or three persons and the other 24 who were at the beginning there they are gone perhaps were inside of the shop in the supermarket but normally they wouldn't be there after a while so what is happening with these uh, people 
Okay. Who wants to start? Steven? Uh, just quickly, uh, the first uh, question, um, the part that stuck out to me was about uh, women in the labor force. And uh, certainly you're right, um, women and young people are more impacted by these trends. And I was looking at the economy as a whole, not just the digital economy. Uh, the numbers are from the, the, the German economy as a whole. Uh, I, I don't see that the fact that it's happening to women should be any reason to somehow, I, I mean, it seemed to be you were suggesting that it's not as big a deal because it's happening to women, and, and maybe that wasn't your intention, but that's what kind of what I was hearing. And, and, and in fact, to me, <laughs> what you said was more of an argument for why Germany should have something like a portable safety net so that all these women who are working in these part-time jobs, maybe some of them have access to health care through their husband, but is that really the basis you want to continue, that women with part-time jobs only get access to this safety net and support system through their husband. Um, I, I think that what you want to have is uh, something like, um, here's the funny part where I get to try out my German, Künstler Sozialkasse. Those, I mean, Künstler Sozialkasse. Thank you, what he said. Um, you know, for freelancers, for, for people who are journalists and artists and musicians, you have that, and, and also there's a certain classification of home workers that have access to the employers paying a certain amount into uh, for these workers to have a social security net. So I, I, I'm saying we should have a ka es ka for all. That, that that's what Germany should look into is ka es ka for all to make sure that no worker gets put into a precarious situation, whatever their situation is. Thank okay. you. I, I, I completely agree on the car as car, but I think the, the, the problem is, is when you talk about full-time and part-time employment, and when you say part-time employment is the problem, we had for a very long time, we had a very strong focus, you know, Germany is a conservative country, and in particular the role of women on the labor market is, is often shaped by very conservative views, but we used to have a system where it was clear that, you know, you had the full-time working man and the part-time working woman, and and this was for a very long time, you know, you know, our conservative system. So we we do not do not really see that as as a great role model. We want to have people to have jobs that they can live off these jobs. But where the, the point where where I would disagree is to say, you know, and therefore we regard part-time jobs as problematic. Part-time jobs are problematic if you have them for. The, the whole length of your life, and if they do not produce the income that you can live off these jobs, yeah. But to say that everyone needs to work full time, go and work full time, and have full time wages is not the answer because it is really it, it, it stresses out societies. If we say you know we have a, a role model of society where everyone works full time from the age of 21 to the age of 67 or something, that would not be the ideal society which we are aspiring to. But what we need is to have a much more flexible perspective on work, that people, you know, you work part time, you work full time, and you move from one stage to, to the other depending on your living arrangements. But at, during the entire time, you need to have an insurance system that provides you with some benefits that it makes clear, you know, once you retire, you have a pension that you can live off, and while you are at work, you're insured in a way, either through unemployment and health insurance, that you do not run the risk to really go bankrupt if something happens. I think that is the, the, the kind of model we need. And the gig economy and the platform economy is only one part of it, and it, it, it is a small part of this, this bigger picture. Yes, I, I agree completely. Even traditional economy, you have a lot of part-time and temporary jobs, and the goal shouldn't be to turn those into full-time jobs, because as I said, the full-time jobs are disappearing, and I don't see that they're going to come back. The goal should be to figure out how to make those part-time and temporary jobs into good jobs, where they're fully supported, um, you know, let them have the flexibility and the security, both, instead of one or the other, which is how it is for many workers now. And by doing that, you really will unleash the, you know, the genius of German workers. They, they won't be stuck in a full-time job they don't like because that provides a, a, you know, retirement and the security that they want. And if they go to a, a, a freelancer job, they won't have it. They'll be free to go to where they need to and, uh, and really you know, fulfill their potential. Yeah. Stephen, let's, let's yeah. bring, bring Anna in again. Because the lady to the left, she, she asked, uh, she, quite, quite, quite obviously, she, she, she stated that um, the question we're talking about is obviously about labor and social issues, but also about other, other issues, right? So, so what other issues is it about? And then bringing it back to labor and social issues. Um, what is interesting in Germany is that you have some kind of basic agreement between, let's say, the capital and the labor side, that it's in the common interest of the society to have high-quality jobs, right? And you're saying that in your business model, there is part of the 
startup world which is interested in high quality jobs. And then, as, as Anke said, we have to differentiate, right? There are some kind of startup business models that are based, of, based on um, churning high quality jobs into low quality jobs. And then there's business models like yours. So do we actually need some kind of, let's say, social movement within the startup scene saying that we are actually standing in for this kind of model of a society which is based upon high quality jobs? And shouldn't these startups, so to say, distance themselves more from those actually employing a model which is based upon low quality jobs? But first about the labor and, and not, not labor and social issues. Okay, so I actually agree with yeah. Anke that part-time jobs is not okay. the problem, but rather the solution. And I must say, like from our side, for example, we have quite some workers who are working part-time who at some, at some point in their career have the wish to have one or two days off per week and doing other things, taking care either of their children or doing some more creative things or things that they, they always wanted to do. And we are completely open for all kind of actually flex flexible working models. And I think like coming back as well to the man-woman question and while there are so many uh, women among um, the part-time uh, jobs or is, is actually I, I think what, what needs to change and what is actually it's rather our problem is that at least in Germany, I don't know how it is in the US, it is actually not possible to be part-time and still be a leader, so still lead a team. And this is something that we need to rethink completely in society, because I actually think that part-time workers can be leading a team perfectly, so because they are not there all the time, they need to build up a great team behind them, they need to be very precise in what they want, they need to have a very motivated team, and so on and so forth. So, great circumstances, actually, to being a good leader and still working part-time, but this is very, very rare, and I think we, we need to see this um, yeah. coming, actually, over the next years to, to solve this and to, as well, um, solve the, the, the female yeah. man ratio yeah. in, in that topic. Yeah. <laughs> Anke, do, do, do you think this could be some kind of a Standort Vorteil? So, so to say, the, the, the USP of, 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 of Germany, which could be a place where you can actually combine um, work-life balance, all these kind of models you've just been talking about, with a very dynamic, flourishing, innovative, uh, technology-based uh, ecosystem. So could this be like what makes Germany special as opposed to the US, for example? You mean the, the working, working term arrangement? Or yeah, that, that, that com, or com, work, coming to Germany, starting yeah. a startup here, or starting to work for a startup in Germany, this will mean that you can have both, right? You can have the Scandinavian way of living and the Silicon Valley um, <laughs> style of innovativeness okay. and dynamism. <laughs> okay, between, between um, uh, Scandinavia and Silicon Valley, you know, Germany is a third a third model, and the third model is actually conservative. If you say Scandinavian, Scandinavian is a social democratic way of life, and then you have the Anglo-Saxon way of life. But, you know, I wouldn't be too over-optimistic about, um, you know, the part-time, full-time men, women situation, because it is an expression of a conservative lifestyle, and we still do have a, you know, conservative traditional role for women who work part-time. So I'm not absolutely, you know, over-enthusiastic about it, but I would agree that that when we want to, uh, to, to achieve gender equality, we need to be much more flexible in the way we work, and we need to be much more flexible and open towards uh, you know, part-time leadership and part-time roles which can achieve, go up to the top. I, I completely agree with that, and we need to be more flexible about that. Um, to the question, is that a, you know, do we have uh, you know, something to offer here? I think what we do have to, what, what we can offer is actually a, a better working time arrangement in, you know, we have one of the lowest uh, working hours per year. You know, Germany is, if you look at the statistics of the OECD, you know, working hours in Germany are relatively short. And that is not just to do with part-time, but it is also full-time workers 
work relatively shorter working hours, you know, in, in many areas. And that, by definition, you could say, you know, that enables much more work-life balance than if you have live in a society where working hours are extremely long. And that often has to do with the gig economy, often has to do with freelancing, etc., where you find overly long uh, working hours. So the picture would be mixed, I would say. Yeah, let's take the question over here. Hello, my name is Andrea Schneider-Dörr. I'm a lawyer and I'm working on, I'm a PhD candidate and I'm working on legal uh, standards for crowd work. And uh, thank you so much for your discussion. And my question is, so in Germany we have a strong connection uh, between social security and employees. It's strongly connected to this status. So is it something we can hold for the future and if not, what is the way of um, getting things done? It, it's, it is um, changing the terms of who is an employee or changing the terms of what is social security for the future? That's a very good question. Um, and you. we have a similar debates in the United States about there's, there's a discussion about changing the definition of what is an employee because uh, once you're defined that way, a whole bunch of legal uh, ramifications uh, kick into effect. And there's a talk in the United States about creating a third category of employee because we have regular employees, we have independent contractors, which is like you're solo self-employed. And now there's talk of creating a third category called dependent contractors. I'm not a big fan of this approach um, because what, what usually happens is, like for Uber, uh, there's lawsuits against them because uh, the drivers say, we're actually your employee. Uber says, no, you're, you're, you're contractors. You're the CEO of your own driving business. Um, and so they aren't responsible for any of the social security and labor protections, nothing. And um, so you could create another category, but then the lawyers for Uber just go to work at finding the loopholes in the new, new category. My approach is more, let's create, uh, as I said, good jobs out of part-time jobs. Have, this, have all types of jobs, no matter how you're working. If you're an Uber driver, Uber still is responsible, as is the driver, for some degree of your social security costs. Uh, every business would have to be responsible for any employee, employee they hire, no matter how many hours, um, what the, the conditions are. And by doing that, you get past the loopholes, you get past the lawyers, because no one is out, is out of the system. There's no in and out. There's no labor market insiders, labor market outsiders. Everybody is covered to some extent. That, to me, is the better way. And the way for the future is we get more into the digital economy and more into automation, algorithms, robots, things that are going to be replacing humans, um, we have to be really clear in covering the people that do have jobs so that uh, they aren't even more labor market outsiders than they are now. Uh, and I think that's a real danger. Anna, Anna, do you think this is feasible? So, so have, to have some kind of like pooled contributions, so you're going to have freelance work, but you're going to have pooled contributions. H hard for me to say. I mean, I, I'm... I'm so in, in a certain point, I'm, I'm missing kind of in this whole discussion, actually, two views on this whole situation. And the one is the view of the customer and the other one is the view of the employer who really wants to be flexible mm -hmm. and who really maybe does not want to work full time and who wants to have, have a life. And we, we see so, so many people who so highly value the flexibility that, that, that we have that it's actually not like coming from like the evil companies who are not offering full-time secure jobs anymore but it's more what's requested from many many people today to have the flexibility to move around to be free to move to other cities and and so on and so forth so um i mean of course as a company i'm very willing to take responsibilities for the people who are who are working um in in our company, but I think you need to as well like not look from it so much from this past world, but really think what what, what the workers want today, or many yeah. of them. Well, so I so think that's what we're, we're uh, what, you know that's what we're saying is tr ha creating a system where those workers can still be part time, still have the flexibility, go to another part of the country, work for another employer if they want. But by doing that, they're not missing out on. Social Security, which so many of the workers, I mean, how many of you, you have 300 employees, how many of them are regularly employed workers, how many of them are freelancers, what percentage, roughly, 
or is that top trade secret and you can't tell us? It, no, it's not. So, I mean, so if, out of the 300 people that we employ, 150 are the stylists, so that are the ones who are um, styling our customers and putting together outfits for our customers. And, and they are all fixed employed with our company because we want to keep them long term in the company and we want to offer them a good and, and, and safe job, actually. So and the that, other 150 are uh, the, most of so the others are f just from the other departments, and most of them are fixed employees. So we only have a handful of freelancers uh, okay. currently. Most of them in IT, and most of the freelancers that are working for us in IT, we would love to hire um, on a fixed contract. But they say, oh well, no, I I very much appreciate to be actually that flexible, and maybe in six months I will move to Spain. Who knows? So so with so few of them that are freelancers like that. If there was a requirement that you as the employer, okay, you still have to pay something into this, this freelancer's social security, then it wouldn't be a big cost to you. It, it, it's something that could be doable. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, final, yeah. F final, final question to, to, to Anke. Do, do you think Stephen's model of a portable uh, social security uh, net is, uh, is, is feasible? And would this also be thinkable across the European Union? Oh, wow. Um, <clears throat> I think the question by the PhD student, um, you know, do we actually start changing the definition of an employee mm -hmm. or do we start changing our social security system? That is the, the, the crucial question mm -hmm. because that is where you have to take a decision. Either you declare many more freelancers as employees, either as dependent contractors, but or you just declare, you know, if you're in, in such a freelance relationship, we treat you as employees and therefore we uh, put you into all, <coughs> into all the social security systems, which are much more costly than what they are they are doing now. That would be one solution. The other solution is really to open up social security systems to people who are now freelance. And we have to do one or the other, or we have to do both. Okay. Yeah? And that is the, the big question. I would say we have to do both. We have to really change the way we look at employees and, and dependent contractors and, and define very clearly what the, the distinction is. But we also have to do something about uh, social security yeah. system, and that is where the portable system comes in. Should we have individual accounts for people who have who are freelance who earn some social security rights from being freelance and if they move to an, to another job or to another uh, contract they can take their account with them i think that is in principle a good idea the the big question is always how does that relate to existing social security accounts because yeah. you know you is that just part of the old account is that a new account and who pays into that because very often you know freelancers are attractive because because they're cheap, and they're cheap because they don't pay social security uh, contributions. We have and, to stop here. And someone needs to pay for that. So. Thank you so much. We have to stop here. What we learned this afternoon, that the future of work and making Germany a leader in the digital age is apparently very much about labor and social policy. Thank you all for coming, and thank you three on the stage. Thank you. Thank you.